Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, well, um, good morning. Uh, thanks for being here. It's my pleasure to introduce Albrecht Lind uh, Lindner. Um, his uh, PhD student at EPFL under the supervision of Sabine Sustrunk. Uh, he's actually defending um, next month, so he's be f finishing his PhD very soon. Uh, his interest is in statistical methods for uh, scene understanding and uh, scene enhancement, and uh, the talks about the give is based on his thesis. Great. So uh, thank you for the introduction, and uh, thanks for being here despite the upcoming CPR deadline. Uh, I'm glad you uh, made some time. <laughs> um, so before I start my talk, I maybe give a short introduction on my academic background. So I started uh, a master's in electrical engineering in uh, Stuttgart in Germany. And, uh, then after that, there was a possibility to do a double master's program with a university in Paris, uh, where I focused on image and signal processing. And uh, right now, I'm doing a, a PhD at uh, EPFL Switzerland. And as Sing Bing just said, I will defend soon. And um, so my professor is uh, Sabine Süstrunk, and the industrial sponsor is uh, OC Cannon. Uh, these are the ones that uh, enable me to do this work. And before I start with the academic part, I want to make also make a quick note. So I make, I'm having a kind of one-person business for a bit more than 10 years now. So I'm doing this a bit in parallel and, OK, a bit less than the last time, but still. Um, so I'm building props for magicians. And uh, so these things are maybe a bit unknown domain for you. So I give a uh, quick intro. So you start with an illusion design, so the magician comes to you and tells you what kind of effect he wants to realize. And then you check out how you could make it possible that uh, the audience gets the illusion of some, some effect. Then I built these devices. Of course, you'd use wood and metal for the physical structure. But then also, depending on the magician's need, you also maybe have to build uh, printed circuit boards, uh, program microcontrollers, or do some power electronics in order to steer different flashes or uh, motors or engines to make something happen on the scene. And uh, so this is not really a toy, so we're a bit serious about that. So the, the gadgets that I built, we won uh, different uh, uh, international prices. And um, so I won't go deep into that. Of course, uh, I would like to share all the secrets of all the magicians. <laughs> but in the interest of time, I will now go to the academic part. Um, so the outline of my talk is, I will present you two different things. Uh, the first one is semantic image enhancement. This is, uh, was presented last week at ACM Multimedia. And the other one is automatic color naming. This will be presented next week at uh, CIC in Los Angeles. And both of them together, they work on, they use the same statistical framework at the bottom. They're just uh, two different applications for the same uh, mathematics, uh, mathematical concepts. So we start with semantic image enhancement. And the first thing I would like to pose is a question. And the question is, which image is better? So do you have an opinion? Which, who, who prefers the one on the left? You won? OK. <laughs> <laughs> so and the others prefer the one on the right, I guess. Huh? OK. So the thing is now, the question was a bit unfair, because I didn't give you all the information. Additional information could have been, who prefers the, one, the image for the concept dark? And which image do you prefer for the concept of snow? And in any case, if I ask you for, the, for an image for the concept of dark, you would have said the left image. And for the concept of snow, you would have voted for the right image. The same is true here. You have uh, this again. It's the very same image. These are just two different versions of it. And the one has been enhanced uh, for a sandy beach and the other for a sunset. So the point what I want to give here is, but, but, yes. But the one for sand actually looks unnatural, regardless of what you say, right? It looks unnatural because you don't naturally see 
you know, the appearance of the sun like that, when everything is so bright? That's true. So, uh, it's, I made the processing quite strong here in order to show the difference between two images. Uh, you can, of course, just make the processing a bit less strong and do something in the uh, intermediary. This is just to, to demonstrate you the, the uh, difference between the two concepts. So, so the main point here is that y you can't decide which image is better if you don't have uh, the semantic context but only the pixel values. And this is the reason why any kind of auto-adjust of contrast and colors that can do a decent job but you will never get to a position where you can actually enhance an image for a semantic concept. The only, reason to do th uh, the, the only way to do this is to do manual editing. So use Photoshop or some other tool. And if you give such an image to an artist and say, like, make it look like a sunset, he will do something like the one on the right, for instance. But of course, like, manual editing is uh, good, but it would be nice to have something automatic. So the goal is to have an automatic enhancement with semantics. And so now let's look at what are the solutions that are provided today. So one possibility is to have modes. So you have cameras that have a portrait or a nature or a firework mode. And depending on the mode that you're setting, your camera will apply a specific uh, processing to it. Or you have printers. They have modes such as draft or presentation. And then again, each mode then uh, um, invokes a different processing that is adapted to the context. Or there are other methods that do a classification plus an enhancement step. So there are different publications and they try to uh, classify skin or sky regions or some other classes. And then for each region in the image of a class, you apply specific processing. So if you detect skin regions, you just make sure that the skin tones are, are correct or not too reddish or something like that. So the problem with all these methods is that they're difficult to scale to large vocabularies. So you can, ha you can imagine to have 10 to 20 modes or maybe 20 uh, or 30 classes and then implement a processing for each class. But what is if you want to do 1,000 or 10,000? So this is just not practical. You cannot implement 1,000 different processings for 1,000 different classes. You, you, you cannot do it. So you need some other mean to, uh, to take semantic context information and process the inner image accordingly. So, and this one point I want to make clear is that, so we are not doing a classification task. So a classification task would be to go from an image to the keywords. However, in our case, we have a keyword and we want to apply this keyword to the image. So we're going the other way around than a classification task. And what we need is, uh, we need something that tells us a keyword significance for an image characteristic. And we need a real characteristic that makes sense to change an image. That's why we can't use SIF descriptors or bag of words or, or these kind of descriptors. These won't work because we need something that we can actually change an image, so, such as lightness, color, or depth of field for frequency distributions. And so, so the way we uh, uh, measure the significance for a keyword is the following. So we start with a big database. So we have 1 million images plus keywords. It's a database that is public and available that is from Flickr. And now, for example, let's look at the keyword uh, night and the characteristics. We just uh, look at some gray levels. So what you see here is um, on the x-axis is a histogram with different uh, gray level bins that go from dark to white. And uh, on the y-axis, you see how many percent of the pixels in an image have uh, fallen to this bin. And you see here that uh, for night, for instance, is you have, on average, a bit more than 20% of the pixel actually fall in the darkest bin. And this is quite more than for images that are not annotated with night. And you see, on the other hand, he, on the other side here is that night images, they have less pixels that fall in the bright bins, whereas the images that are not untaped with night, they are higher. So the question is now is, can we assess the difference between these two distributions? So, so each bin is a distribution. So this is a distribution here, the, the median and the 25 and 20, 75 percent, uh, percentiles. And uh, can we assess the difference between these two distributions for every single bin? 
And the thing is, we don't really know the, um, the distribution a priori. The thing is, we, we want this thing to be very versatile. So we don't make any assumptions of how the distribution might look like. That's why we're using uh, non-parametric significance tests. Because we don't want to assume this is a Gaussian or, or whatever distribution. We just want it to be general. So we're using a non-parametric significance test. And so there are a couple of significance tests that uh, do that, that compare two distributions, no matter what their, uh, what their actual distribution is. Um, so three of the well-known ones are the uh, wilcoxon ransom test, the kolmogorov snurov and the chi-square method. And I have here three uh, example inputs to demonstrate the difference between these methods. So the wilcoxon ransom test just measures a difference in median. So you see here when you have a two probability distributions that just shifted, um, your test statistic will be this part here, the difference in median. However, if you just have two distributions that have the same median, but they just have different shape, you will not measure any difference. So it's zero, and the same for the bottom case. The Komogorov smirnov just measures the maximum difference between the two cumulative distribution functions along the x-axis, and that's why you measure here also difference in shape but you don't measure anything here. And last year, the chi-square method, because you make yeah, the difference in each single bin, you will measure actually also a difference between this, uh, these two distributions at the bottom. So the thing is, in our case, when we, we want to do image enhancement, we just want to in or decrease an image characteristic. So we do not care about the shape. We just want to increase or decrease. So in our case, we're using the Wilcoxon method because we don't want sensitivity to shape changes. But of course, if you had some other application in mind, you might want to use a different test with different properties. But isn't, isn't this shape distribution very typical of contrast? When you sort of you know, reduce your contrast, it gets sort of gray and muddy. If you really push the contrast, then things move out to the edges. Sure, but you can still do that. I, I can show this in the next slide. So um, this is the same plot. You see, again, the distribution from images with night and anatomy with not with night. So if you then compute uh, the uh, z-value, this is just a test statistic um, minus the expected mean divided by the variance, which gives you the z-value, is you actually see that, so it is positive here in the dark bin, so it means there are significantly more pixels with a dark gray value. And here it is negative, that means night images ha have significantly less pixels with these bright gray values. And now for instance, if you wanna enhance the contrast, you would actually shift, according to this thing here, you would say, ah, yeah, I need more pixels here. So you shift pixels to this side, and you need less pixels here, so you move them out of this region. And then you actually have, and if you do contrast stretching, you would have a similar distribution that would tell you, you need more here, more here, and less here. And then you just move out of the middle, and you go to the sides. And so this now is an example for grade level characteristics, but you can, of course, do other characteristics. So here you see, uh, uh, in C-Lab space, here's the keyword Ferrari, and you see here uh, a three-dimensional histogram and the, the z-values in there uh, with these three heat maps. And you see that the maximum here at the crossing actually is in the red region as expected for Ferrari. And you can do more, for instance, here we have uh, z-values for red, green, blue, and flower. And here at the top you see the U-angle. So you actually see that uh, red has significantly more pixels in the, in the red bins and green more in the green bins. Uh, flower has not a, it's a bit less significant, but also has some peaks in the red regions. And if you look at linear binary patterns, you see that red, green, and blue don't have very significant patterns. However, flower has, and this just means that flowers, they have less angles that are very pointy, and they have more angles that are flat or, or obtuse. Just that kind of means flowers have just round shapes. Okay, so, so you, you see all these uh, statistics and you, you, you see these patterns as, as expected in the data. Or you can do a spatial layout, so here's the keyword light, and you see that uh, um, in the center of an image, so, so this is just a spatial layout, so we, we just take an eight by eight grid that we superpose of the image, no matter what the aspect ratio the size is. And then you see here in the middle, you have slightly positive values. It means the center of an image and of light tends to be a bit lighter in the middle, but it's definitely a lot darker on the surroundings. And here's a just typical example that shows you why, uh, the reason for that. Or here we did um, 
uh, spatial chroma layout here, the keyword is barn. And you see here that uh, in the center image, where you often have a barn that is made of wood, which actually is a low chroma object, you have significantly less chroma pixels. And especially at the bottom, where you have like grass or nature scenes, you have a high chroma. And that's why the values are positive here at the bottom. Or you have, for instance, fireworks here. You see, uh, so these are GABA filter layouts that kind of tell you how much structure there is. And you see that here at the, the top is a blob that is from the fireworks, and the bottom is mainly an illuminated city. So from this, we can predict that we have a firework in the image? Uh, no, what it tells you could, but that would, be that would be automatic image classification. That would be to go from the image to the keywords. Okay. What I'm doing here is the other way around. So what I'm doing here is tells me, if you have an image with fireworks, there probably is a lot of structure at the top in the middle and here at the bottom. Okay. You, you could potentially use it also to make an automatic image orientation, but this is not the goal for this work here. And there's one more point is this is very efficient. So the, this uh, wilcoxon Ransom test, um, what you need to do is you need to sort all these values in a, in a sorted list. And then you have to compute the ranks of, um, well, of all the elements that belong to the one set. So I won't go into details. But the thing is, you only have to sort this list once. So every additional keyword that you want to measure this uh, significance, it's just it's just a simple sum. So you can do this in a fraction of a second. So we can uh, easily compute uh, for thousands of keywords. And like in my case, I just stopped at around 3,000. Uh, we can easily compute for a large set of keywords. We can compute automatically their significance values at, at almost no cost. Because once the sorting is done, like, they all go like, one after the other very fast. OK, so now uh, I'm going to stop this part. And I will go on to the application, how we used it. Um, which is the first one here, semantic image enhancement. And we implemented three different methods. So we did a tone mapping, uh, we did a color enhancement, and we did a depth of field adaptation. So here for this one, I have to add that so the input images and the method to estimate the defocus map, they come from these authors. However, the algorithm and the output, uh, of the, uh, the output image are going to show you, they're of course our own. So and to show you the principle, I just focus on the color en enhancement. The other two, they, they're just similar. So the, the enhancement pipeline uh, that we're proposing is the following. So you have two independent inputs. You have an image and a keyword. And then you extract characteristics. And you have, on the one hand, you have some of them are, are no. The one part is image uh, dependent, and the other is dependent on the semantics of the keyword. And then you f fuse them together to get an output. And in this case, the image looks a bit more golden uh, than the input. So let me first go to the semantic component. So what we're doing here is, uh, what is, is we take the significance values. In this case, we just do it for the red, green, and blue channels. It's like the uh, gray levels that we saw before, but here it's just for red, green, and blue channels. And you see here that for the keyword gold, you have positive values here for the blue curve, that means you need more pixels that have a low blue content. And you have high Z values here, positive, that means you need more pixels that have a right, high red content. And the green is something in the middle. And basically, this processing just adds a bit more gold to your image. Sorry, this yes. was computed based on many images. Yes, we took this uh, database of one million images. Okay. And then that's how you got that. This is how I get this one, exactly. And from that now, we, we can immediately derive a, a tone mapping operator. So, so we want something. So here's the equation. But what we want something is we want something that accumulates uh, the blue channel in the lower, uh, with low values. So we need for blue a tone mapping function that goes flat at the beginning and then goes straight up. And for red, we need the opposite. We, we need something that pushes the pixels away from the uh, uh, low red values and accumulates them where they're red, high red values. And consequently, we have a processing curve that goes up like this. So, can I ask? Sure. So, for any image that is that I've said it's gold, yes. and I want you to enhance it, you always apply that. Yes. Step, for gold, yes. Okay. So, even within gold, there might be some, you know, differences in, in, in the way people might uh, enhance. 
concept, right? I mean, you're basically saying anything that's gold, I just apply a single type of transformation. Okay, there's a second component that adapts to the image, okay. but uh, the semantic component will always be the same. Okay. So if, if some people have a different imagination of the concept of gold, then um, I need a database uh, from these people to learn it. But then I can do it. So okay. it's, it's just, I, I need data to learn what people mean with the concept of gold. Okay. And if they don't match the taste, in this case, of the Flecker data set, yeah. then of course it won't work. But so, so I'm kind of curious also, um, if I say gold and sunset, yes. what will it do? Wait, I'm going to talk about that okay. later. <laughs> you have going far ahead. Okay. <laughs> and so, and the only thing what we're having, we have like just a single parameter that just tells how extreme the processing is. So if, if S is zero, we will just have the identity transform. And the larger S is, the more extreme the processing will be. Okay, so we have now the semantic con component. And now let's go to the image component. Because if you just apply this tone mapping curve to the entire image, you will affect everything, also the sky, and that won't look good. So we need something that adapts to the image. So for this input image in gold, we uh, built a, a weight map that tells how likely is it that this pixel is part of the concept of gold. Okay. In this case, what we're doing is, is a rather simple method. We just take the, the color value at the pixel and we ask how high is the significance for this semantic concept. And if it's high, you will have a bright pixel here. And if it's low, it's like a dark pixel here on this side. How did you do that? Okay, so we just take the significance values. So right, how do you compute the significance out of a million? I mean, well, out of the subset of images that's been packed gold, right? Yes, exactly. So we have the significance values for gold that we uh, computed from this one million data, uh, images database. Okay. Okay, and this tells me how much each single color is related to gold. This is this is a high Z, this is a high value in the yellowish region and like a negative value somewhere in the red and green regions. Yeah, I mean, I mean there, there must be a technique to allow you to do the tagging. Right? I mean, what, what technique do you use? Well, this is not tagging. So because the, the thing is, I know the keyword anyway. I, I have to, if I the, the, I have two inputs. I have an image and a keyword. Right. So I know the tag of the of this image. Well, oh, I understand, but yeah. every single pixel you're saying the probability that it's actually relevant to gold. Exactly. Right, but the question is, how do you learn that? Well, I learned it from the tag database of one million images that I had at the beginning. Oh, you're looking at the occurrence of the color across the images that's tagged gold. Yeah. So like, the thing is, I have these these significant distribution that I showed you before okay. for. Gold and barn and Ferrari and like oh, any any concept, okay? And so so this is pre-computed and you can just store it. And now if you have this concept of gold, you just look up. Ah, okay. What is the significance distribution for gold? You just take it out of your database. It's pre-computed, and then you can just immediately take every pixel here and look up how significant this is for gold. And you just look it, look it out of uh, up from the distribution, okay? You could, of course, do other methods to actually do uh, um, to find the regions that are relevant to gold. Uh, you could do like you could do a segmentation and then do some more sophisticated computer vision techniques to actually find the regions. And there's a lot of work done, uh, uh, of course. But uh, in our case, we, we just do that. But of course, you, you you can do something more sophisticated than that. Yeah, because I would imagine like things like outdoors, right? It's so. The distribution is so varied that it's not kind of not clear to me. It, the thing is, if the distribution is very varied, your significance values will be very low. So you could just do a threshold and say, uh, if I don't find a very dominant concept, I won't touch the image. For gold, you definitely have a high significance blob in the yellow region that is very dominant. And if you detect that, you can say, OK, like in this case, I really know what to do. And then you go for it. OK, so now we have our image in a semantic component, and we're going to fuse them in a semantic processing step. And um, what we're doing is, so we globally process the image with this tone mapping op uh, function. 
And then we do a reweighting with this uh, weight map here. So we take the input image where the weight is uh, zero, and we take this intermediate image where the weight is one. And in between, we just interpolate linearly. And that means that we just enhance the characteristic in the relevant regions. So in this case, we just touch here the bottom part and increase the goldness here, but we won't touch this guy. And now I'm going to show you like a couple of example images uh, that we processed here. For instance, here, this is the, I will just dim the lights here that you can see this a bit better. So here's uh, for sand. Here, this is uh, for snow. Here's an input image for dark, and now this is the output image. Here, this is a silhouette. There's sunset. There's grass. Autumn. There's a strawberry. So you can see, you, you, you can do any kind of keywords. You're not limited to uh, restricted vocabulary. Here, there's an enhancement for sky. There's a banana, makes the banana more yellow. And um, so this now is uh, for depth of field. So the one before were colors. So now you see here the, the keyword macro indicates that the, uh, the artist's intent was to have a depth of field effect. And if you plug uh, the macro keyword to the, uh, our framework, you will get this as an output, where you blur out the background, but the foreground object remains in focus. And you have here the, uh, for flower, also uh, uh, spatial frequency processing. Or here is this little boy for the keyword macro, also blurs out the, uh, the background. So intuitively, we, f we found this looks quite good. But of course, we wanted, some, uh, wanted to measure the performance of the system. So we did some psychophysical experiments. And the experiment was, um, so we showed two images to an observer, the original and uh, our proposed uh, image. And we also showed them the keyword. And we just asked them, which image do you prefer for this context? In this case, um, context is sand. Uh, of course, he don't, he, he don't even really see that there's a beach. So in this case, people would probably like, rather click on that image. Did so compare against oh, like other techniques that Picasso does? I like that. Yeah. And um, so we did. Um, eight different keywords, 30 images each, uh, different parameters for the scale variable, 30 observers. So in total, there were almost 30,000 Im 30, image comparisons. So we did it in Amazon Me Mechanical Turk. And the result you see here is, um, so at the bottom you see the scale parameter, and here is the approval rate. So anything above 50% means that they approved our image. So when you see that there the approval rate is above 50% for almost all the keywords except light. And I'm going to come back to that later, why that is. And so we did a second experiment um, where we checked for, uh, we just called them reciprocal keywords. So this is an image that you can enhance for two different concepts. So for instance, here, this image, uh, you can enhance it for snow and for dark. And our proposed images are this one for snow and this one for dark. And we tested other methods like um, histogram equalization and Photoshop auto contrast. And of course, the thing is that none of these methods actually is able to take a semantic concept as an input. So that's why the Photoshop uh, and the histogram equalization, like you have the same image here in, in the bottom. So what we did is we, uh, we took uh, 40 observers and we showed them 29 of these image and keyword pairs. And we showed them all four images in a row together with the keyword. And we asked them, which one do you prefer? And they had to pick one out of the four. And the result is here the following. So you see here, this see 25% line. Because if you have one out of four images, if you had pure random, that would be 25%. And you see here that um, our method does indeed outperform the others. And the main reason is that these are uh, keywords uh, reciprocal keywords, and we show them images that you can enhance for the one or for the other. And we didn't find any method that was actually able to enhance an image for sand or anything else. And that's why on this data set, uh, we, we significantly outperform the others, because there's no method that actually can enhance an image for an arbitrary semantic content. So 
I'm going to conclude this section with uh, limitations and future work. So um, there are a couple of keywords that don't really have a significant characteristics. And these are mainly uh, abstract keywords like friendship or boredom. And uh, so at the moment, we don't really know what you would do uh, to an image to increase its friendshipness. Um, it's very difficult. These are very high level concepts. And uh, so we don't really know what to do with those. And um, the thing is also the significance values for these keywords are rather low. So that just means we don't have any significant characteristics for these keywords. Then there is um, some keywords have conflicting meanings. And this is not the reason why we underperformed for the keyword light. The thing is, what our algorithm does, so if you have this an input image and apply the keyword light to it, you will get this an output. So what our algorithm learned is that light images actually are rather dark. And the reason is that in order to have a light source and image, that makes only sense if you have a dark surround. And what are, this, uh, consequently, our algorithm just darkens all the darker region of the image. And actually, the light source here is more salient. It pops out a bit more of the image. However, the observers on Amazon Mechanical Turk, they thought about light. I just want to have a bright image. So they went for the one on the left. So in our current implementation, we are not able to tell whether the keyword light means this more artistic interpretation of light or just something bright. And then another problem that we haven't tackled yet, and this is exactly your question, is uh, multiple keywords or also machine-generated keywords. So it would be good to have something that if you have multiple keywords, that you can weigh them how important they are for the image. Or there could also be machine-generated keywords or, either, or keywords are just wrong. So it would be good to have some mechanism to detect these ones and discard them uh, or just uh, remo remove their influence on the processing. Um, so there was actually a, uh, some work here from the group that was presented last week in ACM where they deal with this problem of imperfect tagging. And so that could be relevant uh, to solve this problem. And the last thing is... Um, we talked about it before, is there's this uh, publication from Singbing here um, that uh, does also context-based automatic image enhancement. And the context base in this case is images that have a similar context in terms of image features. So and it would, would be interesting to see what this framework does, actually, if you query for images with similar keywords. Maybe you can have the same uh, output uh, images or similar effects. So to summarize, I present a system framework that links images, uh, characteristics, and semantics. I pr presented uh, two image enhancement uh, methods. And uh, you can download more images and also the code here from the website. Uh, do you have more questions for that? Or then otherwise, I will move on to the color naming. OK. OK, so this is going to be a bit shorter because um, it uses the same uh, statistical framework at the bottom. So color naming is actually a task that is it's a bit tedious. So the bef before, or like the traditional way to do it is you, you, you show a color name to an observer and you ask him to adjust like some color sliders to find the right color patch. Or you go the other way around, you just show an, a random color patch and ask what is this color. And then the user has to type in the name. So, and of course, this is a, a task that is uh, very time consuming. And uh, so our approach is now just to use the statistical framework. So if you have an input keyword green, we can directly compute from a large database, can compute the significant distribution in color space, and you will find the maximum here in the green region of color space. So, um, and because we, we can go large scale with this framework, we actually wanted to do it. So. We took a database of 950 English color names plus color values. It's uh, the so-called XKCD color survey. And this survey was done with actually psychophysical experiments. People were asked to type in the names for different color patches. And to go even more large scale, we, we asked native speakers to translate uh, this list of 950 color names to nine other languages. So we did Chinese, French, German, yes, some European and uh, Asian languages. And then we did our statistical analysis. So we started, uh, we went on Google image search and we downloaded 100 images per color name. 
And then we converted all of them to CLAP color space, assuming that they're an sRGB. And then we ran the statistical test for all color names. And then we just picked the color bin where we have the maximum significance values. And to account for quantization errors from the histogram, we just then did a billion interpolation in a local neighborhood around this maximum bin. And uh, I'm just going to move on to results now. So you see here for the 10 different languages that we covered and 50 uh, example color names, you see here color estimation. So you, for instance, see uh, pale pink in, in English was estimated to be this color. The, front, the Chinese translation of pale pink then was estimated to be this color. I'm sorry, so they were looking at the English word or at the Chinese equivalent? Um, when, they were, when the Chinese people were asked to pick a pale pink, did they no, see the... They, they, were, they were not asked to pick a pale pink. We no. just asked them, translate these 900 color names mm -hmm. to Chinese. So we asked one native Chinese speaker to translate all the color names to his native language. So that's just one person? One person did the translation of the color names. Okay. And then we did an automatic uh, approach to estimate all these color names, okay. uh, all these color values. Yeah. Okay? okay. But the translation, there could be some bias in the particular word of person since it was just one person translating. That is definitely true. There is some translation uh, problems. I'm going to go to that next. Uh, <laughs> Um, so th this is the, the, the accuracy. Uh, so this looks quite good, but is it actually accurate? And it turns out language is one problem that you, you're dealing with. Uh, so we, we look at the, uh, as an example, at the color maroon. So these are our uh, estimations for maroon. You see here the bars, and maybe dim the light so that you can actually see that, the colors. Um, for the different languages, and here this is the, the delta E distance to the ground truth from the XKCD data set. And the thing is, this XKCD set gives you only the English uh, names and the estimation for the English color name. So that's why, uh, like in English, like the, the delta E distance is 10. This is reasonably good. But like, it, it turns out that there's like a few languages where the error is quite low. And then there's another, another group of languages where the error is quite high. And the reason is that the translator, for instance, for Chinese, he could not find a direct translation for maroon. So he, he, he picked something that is close. Also for Portuguese, for instance, the translation is castanho, which just means chestnut. And that's why like, this is more brown, and consequently, the error is a bit higher. And it, it turns out that all the translators of these languages, they have the color name is something with chestnut in there. So in, in, in German, it's chestnut brown, and this is just chestnut. So the, these are all colors that are chestnutty, and that's why they're a bit brownish, and consequently, the error is a bit higher. But it's not really an error, because it's, just, it's a different word, and you can just compare it to the English value. That, that's why it, it seems high, but actually, uh, the brownish color here is actually correct. And we also put this in perspective. So what we did is we went uh, on the internet. We found different databases that propose themselves uh, estimations for maroon. So Perbrang is an online color database. W3C, they have a definition for uh, HTML web pages. There's X11 from Unix and Maroni. So, so they're different databases. And we compared their values to the XKCD value for maroon. And you see, actually, they are the same scale as ours. No. Oh, I see. This XKCD is, has to be zero because it measures to itself. <laughs> okay. um, so, and what you see here now is the delta E distances, not only for maroon, but for all the color values that we have. And, and you see, like, the, like, 30 seems to be like a reasonable error. This is also what different databases can't agree on. And uh, what you see here is all the delta E distances for our uh, color names, and you see here the median here is is roughly in the region where 30 is. So we could say that half of our color value estimations are actually in in the range of uh, human disagreement. And the other thing is actually these language translations are also challenging, and they add error to the estimation because we don't have ground truth for all these languages. So if we had ground truth for all these languages, actually these errors would all be a bit lower. Okay, so I think I can show you a quick demo of the uh, color thesaurus. Um, so we, we put this online. 
So you see here the, the color name, then sRGB values, CLAV values. And what you can do now is you, you can browse through color space. So you can say, ah, I, I like this color, but just want something that is darker. So you can just click here and you, you go to a darker color. Or you can say, ah, yeah, this is good, but I would like the U angle to be a bit different. And then you, you, you can click through here and it will like walk you through color space to go to different colors. So is, is the upper part changing as you do this, or that's just for paper? This is a color picker. OK, okay. I can so show you this now. So what you can do now is you can also pick a color right. here from the color wheel. And um, then it, it will just give you the closest color it can find. Okay. Or, as, you, as you click down at the bottom. Yeah, this doesn't update. It doesn't update. Uh, yeah. I have to implement that yet. <laughs> what is the color that the algorithm predicted for that particular name? Uh, here, this is the, uh, so this is an input color name. Okay. Uh, light neon green, it will give you this as an output, sRGB values. I see. So it predicts from the name to color, not color. Yes. Okay. You, you give it the name, and it will automatically give you the uh, color values. And what you can also do now is you, you can translate it, but not in terms of, of uh, language, but in terms of color. So what you can say, OK, it's a nice color in English, but what actually is the closest color that a German person would use? And then you will say, ah, OK, this color is close to the German color experiment, which is a grüne Minze in German. Or you can also go to Chinese and then say, ah, OK, this, uh, a Chinese person would call this color spring green. And you can, of course, also query. So you can say uh, you have then different types of Burgundy. And uh, so if, if you want, you can, uh, we can make a challenge. Uh, name me a color name, and I will try to look it up in my database. Ochre. Ochre. Okay. There you go. Let's try Viridian. Excuse me? Viridian. V E R I D I A N. R I. Okay. It's okay. Not Don't. Okay. <laughs> okay. I, I can add. Okay. So you won the challenge. <laughs> <laughs> so we have. Uh, yeah, okay. Well, what kind of tint is Viridian? I think it's a, a kind of green. A kind of green? Yeah. Okay. But it's, it, it, if you're an artist, then certain paints are named by the pigment, just like ochre. Yeah. There are certain, uh, like vermilion. Oh, you have vermilion, so that's a red. And yeah, I that, that I have yeah, here. That's right. Yeah. Okay, so um, it's true. So the, the, the survey was not done by artists. These were just random people on the internet, and they might not know all these uh, special terms. But uh, I, I'm sure like you, you, we, we could add it. So I will. What was it? Viridian? Viridian. I'm trying to find if it's actually on, uh, on the web, because I can't find it. So I may have just hallucinated that. Well, there, there is a Viridian color, V-I-R-I-D-I-A-N. V-I? V-I. R I. There it is. So there I was just misspelling it. Ah, it is. It's Viridian. the top one. Viridian. Okay. I, I just didn't so actually know I have it. Spelling. Yeah. Okay. It's All right. <laughs> okay. So um, you can play with this. Uh, it's it's online. And um, with that, I uh, come to my final conclusions. So I showed you a statistical framework that is easily scalable because uh, it's, uh, there's a very efficient way to implement this test. Um, I showed you two applications, the semantic image enhancement and uh, automatic color naming. And I hope I could convince you a bit that semantic context actually is helpful uh, for image processing in general. So uh, thank you. And uh, if you have question answers, I take them. So any other questions? I actually have one. Um, I, mm -hmm. I was, I think you kind of glossed over the case where you're, you're doing the automatic depth of field. So the training is not, the transformation is not color anymore, right? It's, 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 it's the amount of blur that you add in. Exactly, yeah. So how do you decide what is foreground, what is background? Yes, good question. So the, the thing is, uh, let me just go here. Because that seems to be a pretty difficult problem in general. It is, yeah. So it, for the color case, we had 
a semantic part that is just a tone mapping and an image part that tells you where to apply it. Okay? So for the depth of field, you have the same. You have like a filter in the frequency domain, in the Fourier domain, uh, that you estimate also from your significance values. And uh, for macro, it, it just tells you you have to reduce your uh, high frequency content. So, it, so it has to be, it has to have a reasonably low frequency content to start off with. That, that's how you figure out that that's actually exactly. the background. Exactly. And the map here, the bait map, is, is a, is a so-called defocus estimation that tells you which, each, uh, which region of the image are already a bit out of blur. And then you just add it there. Okay, just enhancing the amount of blur. Exactly. And uh, so this is, this is not our own algorithm. There, what I said at the beginning, we have from Zoo and uh, Sim, we, we use their depth maps uh, to, uh, to do this task. There's different methods out there to do uh, defocus map estimation, and uh, we, we just use one of them. Okay. Right. So if you want to sharpen everything, you can still do it, say, do the opposite, right? Basically figure out what I, I guess we haven't tried that, but uh, I guess you can also do that, yeah. Sharp, sharp is hard because, you know, the, the blurred content isn't there and you get ready. Extra oh, yeah. blur. Slightly sharp. Slightly sharp, yeah. So Extra I blur think is what, easier. What you could do if you have keywords that indicate structure that you know, for instance, keyword uh, fence or architecture or grid or something, you, you could try to learn that, for instance, architecture, you have a lot of right angles. If you have a if you have a descriptor for that, you, you, you can learn that there's a significant amount of right angles in the image. And then you could try to do some enhancement uh, based on that, that you say, OK, this image is, added with, uh, is architecture. So I try to find something like right angles and then uh, increase your sharpness there or something. So I guess it's possible. Uh, we didn't do it. Right. Another very common you know, um, image is like documents, right? You know, it's text. So you know, anything that you know that you think might be part of a text, which is sharp and it Yes, sure. So you could, um, what you could try to do is, if, for instance, if you have a scanner and you have mixed, uh, mixed regions, so you have some region with text and some with images, you could, um, if you know that it's a mixed document, so you, 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 what you could do is you, you could try to detect, is there any text in the image? And, uh, then you could actually do th two things. So if you know that there's text in the image, you sharpen these regions. But you could also try to use an OCR uh, character recognition to actually read the text, and because it might tell you something to the image that is next to the text. And then you can, and if it talks about a sunset or something, then you can not only sharpen the text, but you can also make the sunset look good. So, so the processing from left to input to output is just in fraction of a second because everything's pre-computed? It's the same, yeah. Okay. It's, it's like all you're doing is, so you, you have to look up significance values uh, for the keyword. It's just a lookup. And um, well, then you just have a tone mapping. It's, it's very, very fast. So this is, I think it's, it's suitable also for embedded system because all you need is a database with significance values and like a, maybe a, for a few thousand keywords, and, and that's it. And you just look them up and apply it to the image. You think it will work for a like mobile phone? Get a picture and then you could, yeah, you <laughs> could. And then you could say, I have a nice image, and I want to enhance the beachness of my image or something. And then you could have a slider that increases beach in your image. You, you, you could have that, yeah, sure. Any other questions? If not, let's thank the speaker once more. Thank you.